If you would like our free newsletters on various religious topics, just send us an email at cdebater at aol.com and free newsletters will be sent to you by mail. Just provide your postal address in your email. The following are samples of some of the newsletters we have available. Does God Believe in Atheists? Part 1 Seventh-day Adventism True or False? The Agony of Deceit The Origins of Muhammad's Religion Spiritual Warfare Are Psychic Mediums Communicating with Ghosts or Demonic Spirits? Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. From Tradition to Truth, a Priest's Story. An Evaluation of the Oneness Pentecostal Movement. Mormonism, Counterfeit Christianity. Turn or Burn. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceived Deceivers. Links to these newsletters can also be found at our website www.biblequery.org Once on the home page, simply click on the menu icon at the upper left hand corner. Then click on the newsletters button. Feel free to print them out. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for being with us for another presentation of Christian Answers Presents. Today I'm introducing a video done by my colleague in this ministry, Rob Zins, who is a former Roman Catholic. He has a ministry called uh, A Christian Witness to Roman Catholicism, CWRC, uh, on his website as it's called, and you have access there to all his uh, books and video resources and everything else, pamphlets, things of that nature, dealing with Roman Catholicism. Rob, of course, has done many debates. Uh, he's done just, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred videos already uh, with us, just on Roman Catholicism, besides other ministries that he's done videos with. And so uh, our viewers should be well acquainted with good old Rob. And he decided to do this research video on uh, someone who used to be an evangelical. In fact, I think he was the head of the evangelical society. And he was like the top dog for evangelicals back, then, back in the day. And uh, so Rob wants to do a... A research project on Frank Beckwith and his apostasy into a patently false religion, which is easily which is easily proved by biblical analysis, study of church history. We've done all these things. We've got over 212 videos that we've produced on our playlist on YouTube, just on Roman Catholicism, not counting all the other false religions out there. Uh, we've got a whole playlist with over 200 videos just showing how Roman Catholicism is completely false and is a false gospel. And of course, uh, when people are deluded in believing lies, you can talk to them until you're blue in the face and they still won't believe you no matter how much evidence you present. But uh, we, that's why it takes a sovereign, supernatural act of God for anyone to come to Christ. Because without that power of the Holy Spirit, you can't overcome the three main elements that stop a person from coming to salvation to the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel of his grace, which is the world, the flesh, and the devil, as the scripture talks about. And without power from on high, from the Holy Spirit, that supernatural power, a person in their own power 
their own willpower, you might say, cannot overcome those obstacles. They're going to get swept away by, by them and swept right into false religion, which is what the devil mainly employs to keep people from going to heaven, keep them from going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, keeping them from salvation, uh, and letting them just go their own way, thinking they'll be all right with God, when these people that think they're right with God are not. And they're in for an unfortunate revelation at the end of their lives. And when judgment day comes, it'll be perfectly obvious to all creation what's going on. But for now, in this life, you know, people don't see things clearly as is expressed in the Word of God so clearly. But of course, uh, the natural man cannot understand the things of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. That's Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 14. And so truer words cannot be spoken except for all the other words in the inspired word of God, the other 66 books of the Holy Scripture, which Jesus said was from God. Now, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't really agree with that. Well, anyway, I'm getting off on a long sermon here with unintended, but I, uh, I just wanted to introduce Rob's presentation dealing with uh, Frank Beckwith, who apostatized from the Christian faith, was a professing evangelical. Now, we know that evangelicals are filled with heretics, lost people, and I, we put out a lot of videos dealing with this for a long time. Uh, one of our favorite videos to ex expose this has been out for decades called 87% uh, of evangelicals do not know what the gospel is and they do not know what justification by faith is. Uh, the evangelical church is just packed with false believers. And I would say it, the, the percentage is probably greater than 87% of these so-called evangelicals are false believers. They're, they're fake Christians. And that's why they get along so well with false religions. You've got all these apostates out there like uh, <clears throat> Hank Hanegraaff. He used to be uh, the Bible answer man, uh, follower of one of my mentors in the ministry, Walter Martin of the Christian Research Institute. Uh, he apostatized from the face. You got people like Francis Chan. Now we got videos on all these dudes. Uh, it's terrible. You got William Lane Craig. He's another heretic following Jesuit Molinism, false gospel information. You've got latent flowers, a Pelagian, and a, you know, he won't admit it, but he's an open theist uh, denying the, the, the foreknowledge and providence of God. Uh, it, it's just a terrible situation out there. And most people, because they're not saved either, they love these guys. You had C.S. Lewis and. <laughs> We could go on and on. We've exposed what's going on in the evangelical world, and it's just, it's just terrible. That's a mission field itself. You know, we go out on missions to deal with Muslims and Hindus and other countries. Uh, you've got all these cults, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and things like that. But evangelicals need to be preached to, <laughs> given the gospel as well, because they're just as lost as all the rest of these guys. Uh, I'll have a video coming out uh, soon. We don't have it up yet at the time of this recording, but uh, it's on few are saved. And the Bible makes that very clear. And uh, I think that presentation, when we get it out to the public, is going to prove the point biblically, historically, and statistically. Uh, and it's pretty frightening. It's pretty frightening. There's just not that many truly born-again people by the power of the Holy Spirit out there. Now, tons of people claiming that, but that doesn't make it so just because they say so. But anyway, uh, let's get back to Rob Zins and his presentation here. I would like to mention, with as far as uh, Frank Beckwith goes, about 30 years ago, Frank Beckwith uh, actually came to visit me here in Austin, Texas, and we did some videos together. Uh, in fact, I've got uh, one right here, a video that Frank and me did uh, called Answering the Abortionist Arguments. Uh, and of course, here on the back of this, uh, this uh, VHS tape album, 
Uh, we have a picture of Dr. Frank Beckwith and myself right there uh, in our video that we did on, on abortion. And uh, Frank made some uh, very good philosophical arguments against the murder of unborn babies uh, through the idea of uh, abortion. And of course, also back then, 30 years ago, uh, when he came to town, he also did a video with uh, a, a video here, and here's one called "The Baha'i World Faith." And in this video, and here we see on the back of the cover, he's with uh, Robert Morey in this presentation on the Baha'i World Faith, going into an analysis of that. What's interesting to me that is that when Frank Beckwith apostatized into Roman Catholicism. Uh, one of the first things he wanted to do is he called me up on the phone and he says, take down these videos, <laughs> get them off your YouTube channel. <laughs> I don't want to be seen with you uh, or, or Robert Morey. I don't, I don't want to be seen with uh, people like you that actually take the Bible seriously. Uh, of course, he didn't put it in those words, but... Uh, Anyway, he uh, made a big deal and was really pressing me to get rid of those videos. And of course, I don't like to, I, I've got a limited amount of time to do things. Uh, you know, I work uh, two jobs and I only have a, a, a set amount of time to do video work. And so I don't like to have to get rid of stuff. I already put the time and effort into producing, in other words. And then he's cajoling me and begging me get rid of those videos and finally I just said all right all right you know I'll remake the one on abortion uh, about that and we also re redid the uh, Baha'i World Faith ones I did that with my director of research here for Christian Answers Steve Morrison who also has a PhD uh, but uh, so we replaced those videos with our own stuff uh, mainly because of Frank Beckwith and his insistence that he didn't want to be seen with us which is, you know, fine if that's what he wants. But sometimes, I, I, even if a guy apostatized from the faith, if the material was good and he wasn't apostate at the time, I'll leave the video there. I'll just leave it because it, it had good material that might be useful to somebody. But anyway, it's funny, when I go back over the fact that uh, when I'm filming this right now, last month, I uh, turned 40 years old in the... Christian faith. I got born again in May 1981. And so I'm over 40 years old in the Christian faith right now. And over those 40 years that I've been in, Christ, been in Christian ministry, I have seen so many people apostatize from the faith. You know, they, they seem to be strong Christians they seem to be, you know, they're churchgoers. And, uh, they help my ministry, help me do cable access TV in the studios and everything like that. It, to me, it's amazing. Over 40 years of time of doing Christian ministry, a large, large number of those people have apostatized or left the Christian faith. It's it's astonishing when you really think about it. There's so few, when I go back over to 40 years, <laughs> there's so few left of the ones that used to be around the Christian faith. And it just seems to be getting worse in our society. So it's no, nothing really surprises me anymore when some big theologian or something like that apostatizes, goes off into error uh, because the scripture says this is what's going to happen. And, you know, 1 John uh, in chapter 2 says that uh, they went out from among, from among us because it was to be made manifest that they were not all of us. So they left us. So you have that scripture there that talks about this happening. And I've seen it over 40 years, big time. So to me, it's kind of interesting because uh, I, as I'm doing this, I'm looking at my video guy back there and he... 
He's one of the few that's still with me <laughs> after all these things. <laughs> And uh, I go sometimes as a joke and say, "Well, we must be the elect. We're still we're still in the Christian faith now. You know, we haven't apostatized, and we're still sticking the heart to the Word of God and and holding to the faith and all that good stuff. And uh, we'll praise God for it. But the only way you're going to do that is you've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit within you. You have to be born again. If you're not born again, you're not going to make it." No matter how many degrees you have by, behind your name, if you're a doctor, big shot on TV or radio, it doesn't matter. Yes, you're going to apostatize, go off in the air, be a heretic, and all the rest of it. All right, with all that said, I have uh, some questions that relate to what Rob Zins is getting ready to go into in this video presentation. And uh, he had emailed me these before he did his presentation, which you'll be seeing shortly. And I'm just going to read these questions off real fast as a precursor to what you're about to see from Rob Zins. And he, as he analyzes the uh, apostate Frank Beckwith, who's now into Roman Catholicism. Here's uh, the questions Rob puts forth in this upcoming video. Please give us a little background of Francis J. Beckwith and why he is an important figure. Could you highlight the differences between Roman Catholic view of justification and the Christian view? Three, where do we see the Roman Catholic teaching on justification most clearly taught? Four, in light of Canon 24 of the Council of Trent, which undoubtedly states that good works are the cause and increase of justification, what does Rome do with Romans chapter 4? Five, Francis Beckwith, upon converting to Roman Catholicism, now believes justification is progressive and not a one-time event in the life of a believer. <clears throat> Explain what he means and why do you think he is faithful to the Bible in his assessment? Six, Beckwith claims that Abraham's faith justified him when he offered up Isaac. He quotes James 2, 21 through 24 as a proof text. Is this the teaching of James? Seven, Beckwith claims that the Bible teaches a progressive justification as something that has not been fully achieved in the life of a believer. He uses the word saved to prove his point. Do the words saved and justification have the same meaning? Eight, Beckwith believes that Romans 4, quoting Genesis 15, 6, does not teach a once and for all Forensic justification. Is this true? Nine, Beckwith also believes that Protestant theology teaches that Abraham is reckoned righteous and yet remained inherently unrighteous. What does he mean by this? What does remained inherently unrighteous, end quote, mean? Ten, what about Romans 5.19? Does this not prove Beckwith's point that God makes people inherently righteous? in order to justify them on that basis. 11. Does Titus 3.15 teach a progressive justification that includes sanctification? 12. What is the burden of James in James chapter 2? Is Beckwith right that James teaches that justification is not by faith alone once and for all? 13. Does Beckwith misrepresent his own religion when it comes to good works. 14. What is the most prominent misguided assumption about Christian justification that makes it loathsome to Roman Catholics like Beckwith? Rome seems to be playing a shell game with good works and merit. Please explain. Okay, with these questions asked, we will now proceed with Rob Zins and his presentation concerning Frank Beckwith. Thank you, Larry, for having me here with you. It's always a pleasure to be working with Christian Answers and to be a part of this great ministry, setting forth the Word of God and answering questions about Christianity, especially when they concern uh, those kinds of cults that uh, interfere with a clear and precise proclamation of the truth of God's Word. I think the best way to start this particular video is to introduce the audience to Mr. 
Francis J. Beckwith. I've chosen Mr. Beckwith as the topic of this video because he represents a great number of evangelicals or former evangelicals who have, uh, in one way or another, resigned their membership uh, into the uh, evangelical community and gone into a full-fledged membership in the Roman Catholic community. Now, to start with, I'd like to read for you a short bio of Francis J. Beckwith, because I think that he is a pivotal person in the ecumenical movement. He holds a great deal of sway in both the evangelical community and the Roman Catholic community because of his background. Anybody could go online and read this, but I'll just uh, point out that Francis J. Beckwith currently is Professor of Philosophy and Church-State Studies at Baylor University, where he also serves as Associate Director of the Graduate Program in Philosophy. He's an Affiliate Professor of Political Science, Resident Scholar in Baylor's Institute for Studies of Religion. On his uh, bio, he has a picture of shaking hands with the Pope at Rome, and uh, as we move forward into his bio, we find out that he has an enormous background in studies, and uh, he is degreed to the nth degree, you might say. He was born in Brooklyn, New York, grew up in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, the oldest of four children, attended uh, St. Viator's Elementary School and Bishop Gorman High School, which is a Roman Catholic high school in Las Vegas, and uh, from there on, he is almost like a who's who in American uh, education program. He's a research fellow, James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. He is uh, a member of Princeton James Madison Society, was a professor at Trinity International University, Whittier College, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, PhD from Fordham University, also holds a master's degree of uh, judicial studies from Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. He has written several books, including Never Doubt Thomas, the Catholic Aquinas. Uh, he has also written Taking Rights Seriously, Law, Politics, and the Reasonableness of Faith. He has received the American Academy of of Religion's 2016 Book Award for Excellence in Study, and he has authored a number of other works, including A Second Look at First Things, A Case for Conservative Politics. The list almost goes on and on. Defending Life, A More Legal Case Against Abortion, so forth and so on. We are primarily concerned with one book that he has written, and that book I brought with me today, this is the book we're primarily interested in that came out a number of years ago. It's entitled, uh, Why the President of the Evangelical Theological Society Left His Post and Returned to the Catholic Church. You can see, Return to Rome, Confessions of an Evangelical Catholic. Now, we think that an evangelical Catholic is an oxymoron. Those two words don't go together. But somehow, Dr. Beckwith puts these words together and the framework of his book is to defend his conversion to the Roman Catholic religion. He at one time was president of the Evangelical Theological Society of the United States of America, a prestigious uh, national organization. He resigned that position and converted to the Roman Catholic religion. There are a number of quotes from his book that I want to introduce you to at the point of our start with Dr. Beckwith. In his book, Return to Rome, on page 12, he says this, I, of course, believe that Catholicism is, in fact, in all its dogmatic teaching, including its views of scripture, ethics, church authority, and ecumenical councils. So he believes that Roman Catholicism is, in fact, true in its dogmatic teaching, view of Scripture, ethics, church authority, and ecumenical councils. That's on page 12 of his book. He goes on to say, Much of this book, his book, is a celebration of Christianity that has shaped my life intellectually and spiritually 
both in its Protestant and Catholic forms. Now, I'm going to stop there for a minute and say this. It is difficult for a Christian to understand how anyone could possibly frame the defense of his conversion to Roman Catholicism by talking about Christianity in a Protestant form and Christianity in a Roman Catholic form. We think that these two religions are antithetical, that they're exactly opposite of each other, and it's not a matter of a Protestant form and a Roman Catholic form, it's a matter of true Christianity versus false hope and a false Christianity. Uh, Beckwith is an ecumenist at heart. He believes that we can bring things together, we can harmonize things, and that drastic differences are not fatal. He believes that one can be an evangelical and a Roman Catholic. He believes that one can be a staunch Roman Catholic and easily move in the circles of evangelicalism. We believe he cannot do this. Honestly, we believe that to say that it can be done is disingenuous, and that's going to be the heart of this video presentation, because it is people like Francis J. Beckwith who will be in positions of authority, and here he is at Baylor University. Baylor at one time was a strong representative of evangelical conservative Christianity. Not so much anymore. And uh, Francis J. Beckwith beating being the head of the religious department there is not a good sign for evangelicals in Central Texas because he's going to have the ear and he's going to be in front of hundreds and hundreds of students at Baylor and he's going to be uh, telling them something that we don't believe is the truth and that is that you can be a Roman Catholic, full-blown Roman Catholic and be an evangelical and all in all everybody gets along. His final quote to start out this from page 16 of his book is this. It is my hope that this book may effectively, with grace and charity, communicate to my fellow Christians both Protestant and Catholic and understanding. We have to stop and pause here just for a minute and think about what he's just said. He wants to shape the conversation by saying that my fellow Christians are Protestant, they're evangelical, and my fellow Christians are Roman Catholic. What's the big deal here? I have friends in both circles, I travel in both circles, I study in both circles, and I want to be graceful and charitable to both groups because I've been intellectually and spiritually shaped by both forms of Christianity. And this is the ecumenical speak, both forms of Christianity, both groups, both ideologies. They're both on an equal plane before God. There isn't one necessarily better than the other. There isn't one that's true or false. There's simply two different ways of shaping and understanding Christianity. Well, Francis Beckwith throughout his life has been influenced by a number of people. Like I said, he went to a Roman Catholic high school, but during the first 60 pages of his book, he likes to talk about his relationship with evangelicals, which is interesting to me. He had a strong relationship with Walter Martin, for instance, the founder of the Bible Answer Man. But he's also been impressed by C.K. Chesterton, a conversion to Roman Catholicism, Thomas Aquinas, John Warwick Montgomery, the Lutheran scholar. Uh, Dr. Beckwith likes to drop names throughout his writings of people that he's been in contact with and people that he has been influenced by. So between David Wilkerson, Watchman Nee, Chuck Smith, Hal Lindsey, and others, along with just a whole file of Roman Catholic scholars from Fordham University, there has emerged this personality, this scholar, this representation of ecumenism in the United States. Uh, Dr. Beckwith's primarily contact with the Evangelical Theological Society came from his friendship with Mike Ballman, who at the time was professor at Northeastern Bible College, and he was the review editor for the Journal of Evangelical Theological Society. 
And it's through that relationship where ultimately Dr. Beckwith became the president of the Evangelical Theological Society. He says of his relationship with Mike Bauman, even though Mike remains a committed Protestant and behind the scenes asks me some serious, though fair, questions about my return to the Catholic Church soon after it took place, our friendship and shared devotion to the Christian faith continues without hiccup or pause. I'm going to challenge that. I don't understand how a person can have a shared devotion to the Christian faith when the Roman Catholic religion and the evangelical Christian biblical position are antithetical. They're opposite of each other. We do not believe the same thing. We're not even close. We're not even in the same ballpark. We may not even be on the same planet. And that's what I hope to uh, point out in this video. But... uh, Uh, Professor Beckwith is committed to this position, and if we consider why he converted to the Roman Catholic religion, we're going to find out that there's very little biblical insight into his conversion, very little biblical proclamation, very little understanding of how he came to be a believer in our Lord Jesus Christ. He was asked, Uh, a question of his own heart prior to converting to the Roman Catholic religion. And here's the question he asked himself. Can I, Francis J. Beckwith, can I give a convincing account as to why I should permanently abandon the church of my baptism? Francis J. Beckwith was baptized as an infant in the Roman Catholic religion, and he was raised primarily in his early days, in high school days, as a Roman Catholic. So this is not so much as a conversion, it is more of a return in his own words. He has a summary on page 60 of his book as to why he converted back to Rome. And part of that summary, I won't read all of it for you, but Part of it deals with his understanding of the value of the creeds of the early church. Most Roman Catholics fall in love with creeds, especially the early church creeds. And um, he was so impressed with the creeds that he felt like, if this is the foundation of Rome, then why should I leave Rome? Why did I ever leave Rome? So forth and so on. We'll get into that as we move into uh, our study of his understanding of scripture. But before we turn to that, I would be remiss, and I think it's important for you to understand as a listener, uh, or if you're watching this video, that the differences between the Roman Catholic religion and evangelical Christianity are so vast, the chasm is so vast, so deep, that one cannot cross from one side to the other. It's impossible to be a practicing, believing Roman Catholic and an evangelical Bible-believing Christian. It is simply impossible, and I'm going to tell you why right now. The hinge upon which the entire Reformation swung, the door of the Protestant Reformation swung, if that's a word, swing, swang, swung, whatever, it, the, the uh, most important platform of the Protestant Reformation was the doctrine of justification. How does God justify? Who is justified? What is the ground of our justification before God? Most of you listening understand that justification is the primary focus of the entire Protestant Reformation. So I want to set forth for you right now the vast difference between the Roman Catholic view of justification and the biblical evangelical view of justification. And these are not just views, tomato, tomato, take it or leave it, either one's as good as the other. They are antithetical. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Somebody has set forth something correctly. Somebody has read the word of God correctly, but somebody has not. Somebody's made a terrible error. Somebody's got it wrong. And if you get justification wrong, then you have no gospel to share with anybody. And there is no gospel if you get justification wrong. 
So first, let me set forth the Reformation understanding of justification, or what I would call the Christian understanding of justification. For the Christian, justification is a judicial act wherein God considers the sinner to be justified although he remains at the moment of justification intrinsically unjust and sinful. Okay? Let me say that again. Justification is a judicial act a judicial declaration by God who considers the sinner to be justified or acquitted of his sins. And at the moment of this justification, the sinner remains unjust and sinful. Justification does not change the intrinsic heart from unrighteousness to righteousness. That is not the nature of justification, and as we shall see, that will not be the ground of justification. Justification is not an eradication of sin. It is rather a non-imputation of sin. Sin is not reckoned to the sinner's account. It is a judicial reckoning by God, a declaration by God, that though you are a sinner, and intrinsically you are unrighteous, yet I'm declaring you to be justified and acquitted from that very unrighteousness. Positively speaking, justification is not an inner renewal, and it's not a sanctification. Rather, it's an external imputation of the righteousness of Christ, who lived a perfect life and died a perfect sacrifice. So if I could put it in these words, for the Christian, the ground of justification is the righteousness of Christ given as a free gift to the poor sinner who has no righteousness of his own. The giving of the gift, the declaration that the poor sinner is justified, does not change him or her morally or ethically doesn't change him from an unrighteous person to a righteous person. No, rather it declares him to be justified, to be acquitted of that very unrighteousness on the basis of the righteousness of Christ, which is given freely to the sinner gained by faith alone. The condition for this giving of righteousness, this non-imputation of sin, is nothing more and nothing less than confident faith, which believes without a doubt that God forgives sins based upon Christ's righteousness alone. It has nothing to do with moral renewal. It has nothing to do with ethical renewal. It does not change our heart at all. Justification is not designed to do that. Justification is designed to acquit the sinner based upon the perfect work, the atonement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the Christian view, that's the evangelical view, that's the view of the reformers, that justification is just that. It's a declarative status before God. It happens once and for all. It can never be improved, it can never be changed, and it can never be lost. Now, let's switch over to the Roman Catholic understanding of justification. The Roman Catholic understanding of justification is just the opposite. Roman Catholics are taught that justification is a translation from being born into a son or daughter of Adam into a state of grace and adoption among the children of God through Jesus Christ. Now that sounds positive, doesn't it? But it's not the truth. This is not a translation Roman Catholics believe that justification is a true eradication of sin. Roman Catholics believe that supernatural sanctifying and renewal grace actually enters the human being at the point of justification, whereby justification begins the process of renewal, ethical transformation, and making a person righteous. 
Roman Catholics believe the instrumental cause of justification is the sacrament of baptism. Roman Catholics are taught that in their baptism, they begin a process of justification, and that process is called a renewal, and that renewal changes the person from within. And it's changed by the grace of God, and the grace of God can only be gained in the initial justification through their sacrament of baptism. So they believe in baptismal regeneration, baptismal justification, baptismal renewal, and baptismal eradication of unrighteousness. It's completely opposite of what I've just said about the Protestant view and the Reformed view and the Christian view of justification. Rome goes on to say that the formal cause of justification is the infusion of sanctifying grace which effects an ongoing eradication of sin as well as inner sanctification. And the only way that this grace is gained is through the sacramental system of the Roman Catholic religion. So, when you bring your baby to the Roman Catholic water and the priest pours water over that baby's forehead, the priest is telling you this is the beginning of a progressive justification this is regeneration, this is renewal of the heart, this is sanctifying grace, flooding the soul heart of that baby, and from that point on, to gain justification to a greater extent, or if you should happen to lose justification by committing mortal sins, you regain it by going through further sacraments in Roman Catholic religion. Rome does not believe that justification is a judicial declarative act of God based upon the righteousness of Christ that has no bearing upon the renewal of the interior of the person. We have two different religions here, folks. One is Roman Catholic and the other is biblical Christianity. So how does all this work out in Roman Catholic theology? Well, when we consider Francis J. Beckwith, let me take you back to the first part of his quotations that I read earlier. Remember, this is from page 12 of his book, Return to Rome. Dr. Beckwith says this, I, of course, believe that Catholicism is in fact true in all of its dogmatic teaching, including its views of scripture, ethics, church authority, and ecumenical councils. Well, what do the ecumenical councils say about justification? I brought with me the Roman Catholic source. Anybody could uh, purchase Denzinger. This is one of the finest sources on Roman Catholic theology because it contains all of the ecumenical councils, including the Council of Trent. And I just want to read for a second what Rome really believes about justification, okay? Remember, keep in mind, Dr. Beckwith, I, of course, believe that Catholicism is, in fact, true in all of its dogmatic teaching, including ecumenical councils. So I turn to the Council of Trent, and I want to read to you from the Council of Trent their canons on justification. The first canon I want to read is their canon on cooperation and predisposition for justification. This is Roman Catholic theology at its height and finest. Let me find my glasses here and I'll be able to read a little bit better. All right. Canon 9 of the Council of Trent. I'll read this carefully. If anyone shall say that by faith alone the sinner is justified so as to understand that nothing else is required to cooperate in the attainment of the grace of justification and that it is in no way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema, let him be accursed to hell. So, in Canon 9, Rome says, if anyone says that by faith alone the sinner is justified, let him be anathematized, let him go to hell. 
Uh, Dr. Beckwith says, much of this book is a celebration of Christianity that has shaped my life intellectually and spiritually, both in its Protestant and Catholic forms. Well, wait a minute. The Protestant form believes that we are justified by faith alone and nothing else but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic Council of Trent, Canon 9, says, If anyone shall say that by faith alone the sinner is justified, let him be accursed. Let them go to hell. How do we put these two things together? In this canon, Rome is saying that it is required of men to cooperate in the attainment of the grace of justification. It is necessary that he be prepared and that he be disposed in order to be justified. Prepared, disposed, and cooperate in order to be justified. That's Roman Catholic theology. That's not Christianity. That's not biblical Christianity. That's not what we believe about justification. So how is it that Beckwith can say that I hope this book may effectively, with grace and charity, communicate to my fellow Christians? Why doesn't he tell them the truth? His fellow Christians don't believe in Roman justification, and neither do I. If I'm a Christian, I can't. So how is it that Beckwith can say, my fellow Christians? You see, the ecumenical mindset is so disingenuous when it comes to the baseline theology. Let's move to the next canon. Canon number 11 concerns itself with the imputation of the righteousness of Christ, which is the foundation of Christian justification. Canon 11. If anyone shall say that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of grace and charity, which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and remains in them, or even that the grace by which we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be accursed to hell. This canon denies that the ground of our justification is the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. This canon says it has to include grace, charity, poured forth in the hearts that remains in them, even the grace which they, and denies that we are justified by the favor of God alone. Well, the position of Christianity is we are justified by the favor of God alone, and it is the righteousness of Christ alone by which we stand. It is not grace poured into our hearts, creating charity and love within us that God recommends to us we almost qualify for justification if we keep it up through their system. So it's beyond me. If you read theology and you're at all genuine, You cannot mix the two. They're antithetical. They're opposite of each other. Canon 12. If anyone shall say that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in the divine mercy which remits sins for Christ's sake, let him be accursed to hell. Nothing could be clearer than Canon 12. If anyone shall say that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in the divine mercy which remits sins for Christ's sake. Let him be anathematized and sent to hell. Hopefully, you can understand that the Roman Catholic view of justification is just as bad today as it was in the 1500s and 1600s during the great Protestant Reformation throughout history, They have maintained this position. Francis Beckwith is committed to it. If he's genuine at all, he can't deny it. It's part of what he affirms to be, in fact, true for the Roman Catholic religion. And yet we have all of this business about my Christian friends, my loving Christian friends. We understand each other. We worship Christ together. We believe together and all this nonsense. It's impossible to put these two together. And it absolutely is maddening to think that uh, these people who try, uh, they must hang their brain on a hook before walking to the door. I want to get to canon uh, number 
number 32, because can 32 speaks to the issue of good works and justification. As you know, the Christian position is that our good works do not qualify us for justification. The Apostle Paul is perfectly clear. We are not justified by works, but by faith alone. Over and over again, the Apostle Paul drills this home in his writings. But listen to Canon 32. If anyone shall say that the good works of a man justified are in such a way the gifts of God that they are not also the good merits of him who is justified, or that the one justified by good works which are done by him through the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ does not truly merit increase of grace and eternal life and the attainment of that eternal life. What this canon says is that good works merit eternal life. And anybody who says that they don't, let them be accursed and let them be anathematized. Canon 32 and canon 24 will be the last one that I want to read for you this morning in this uh, particular presentation. On good works preserving justification, Christians don't believe good works preserve justification at all. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's a judicial act of God. It's God satisfied with the atonement of his only begotten Son. But listen to canon number 24. If anyone shall say that the justice received is not preserved, also not increased in the sight of God through good works, but that those same works are only the fruits and signs of justification, but not the cause of its increase, let him be accursed. Nothing could be more clear. Rome believes that good works increase justification, preserve justification. They are not fruits and signs of justification, but they are the cause of its increase. If you don't believe that, then you are anathematized and cursed to hell by the Roman Catholic religion. As I read through this with you, and try to get you to understand what's at stake here. Hopefully you're getting the idea. We don't believe anything that Rome believes about justification of the ungodly. We don't believe anything that Rome believes about salvation, redemption. We don't believe anything that Rome believes about sanctification. We simply don't believe that Rome understands the gospel. And we don't think that Francis J. Beckwith understands the gospel either. Because not only has he converted back to the Roman Catholic religion, but now he's stuck in trying to defend it. And that's where we move next. We could write a book, where do they get this from? As we move into Beckwith's book, we know that having converted back and having had all these doctorates and master's degrees and high positions of prominence in education, Baylor University, Fordham University, and all these friends in the Roman Catholic religion, he still has to do something with the text of the Bible. Because that's the bottom line for a Christian. What does the Bible teach? Does the Bible teach what Rome says in the Council of Trent, in their canons, what Beckmuth maintains as their dogma and their uh, council decrees? No, I don't think so. So what does Beckwith do? Well, the first thing we want to discover is what Rome does with Romans chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Romans chapter 4 is our first defense against the Roman Catholic religion for a lot of reasons. It is in Romans chapter 4 where Paul writes these words. Now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. Paul uses Abraham as the prime example of justification based upon faith alone apart from works. He says it directly. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, 
His faith is reckoned as righteousness, just as also David speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. Works are excluded in the verdict of righteousness, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans 4. Roman Catholic scholars know this. They know they have to deal with Romans 4, and Beckwith is no exception. So what does he do? Dr. Beckwith, falling in line with the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, says this, quote, When Paul writes of works in the context of Romans 4, he is writing about the requirements of the Mosaic law, works of law, including circumcision. He's not required, uh, writing about the requirements of good works in general. So the way Rome tries to get around this is saying, well, Paul's referring to the Mosaic law only. He's not referring to all good works, just the Mosaic law. So therefore, the only works that are excluded, the only works that are dismissed in Romans 4 are Mosaic law works for justification. And that's the way they get around this. The problem with this, of course, is that Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6, where Abraham believes God, and God reckons righteousness to him on the basis of faith. This is long before the Mosaic Law was given, long before Moses was handed the Ten Commandments. There was no Mosaic Law when God made this decision on Abraham. So, to say that the restriction is to only the Mosaic law is to eliminate the life of Abraham because there was no Mosaic law when Abraham was declared righteous in Genesis 15, 6. And he was declared righteousness, righteous not on the basis of works, but on the basis of faith and faith alone. So we're not going to allow Rome to get away with this. Besides, in the context here, there is no caveat, there's no asterisk, there's no footnote that says, oh, Paul is only writing about mosaic works of the law. He's not referring to any other kinds of works at all. All those other works that we insist upon for justification, they still count. Paul's only eliminate mosaic law. Let me give you some food for thought. If the best law in the universe, the most perfect law given by God to Israel could not justify anyone, then what kinds of works do you think we can create that would justify somebody, that would not fail, that would not uh, fail the test of justification? See, Rome's in a quandary here because they have invented a lot of works that they think one should do in order to be justified. Christians don't believe it. We believe we're justified by faith alone. So the problem with Rome doesn't go away by simply saying that Paul is referring to the Mosaic uh, and Beckwith is wrong in his assumption. Beckwith goes on to say, as does Rome, that progress, uh, justification is progressive. And here's how they do it. Beckwith is fond of saying, well, look here. Abraham was faithful when he left Haran. Abraham was faithful when he offered up Isaac on uh, the altar and was willing to kill his own son. Abraham had faith. Abraham had faith before Genesis 15, 6. Abraham had faith after Genesis 15, 6. Abraham had faith here, faith there, faith everywhere. Therefore, because Abraham had all these faith incidents in his life, justification is repeated again and again and again. It's progressive. It starts out small, gets greater, gets greater. The more works you do, the greater the progress of justification. Well, the difficulty of putting all these passages together to prove justification in the life of the believer even though Beckwith and Rome wants to do this, is that none of these passages teach that Abraham was justified by the act that he did during the time. In Hebrews 11, these incidents are recorded to us. By faith, Abraham, when he called, obeyed, going out to a place he was to receive. Verse 17 of Hebrews 11, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. These are scenarios in the life of Abraham but they do not say that Abraham was justified by these events in his life. 
Only in Genesis 15, 6 do we read, Abraham believed the promise of God, and because of that, he was justified. So why is that? Why, why does the Bible not teach, by faith when Abraham was called, he obeyed going out to a place he was to receive And by faith, Abraham offered up his son on the altar, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Why does not the word of God say, by those acts of faith, Abraham was reckoned justified? Why is it reserved only for Genesis 15, 6? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned for righteousness. Why does the apostle Paul repeat that three times in the New Testament? and stand on that ground for justification. Well, I think the reason that it's presented like this in Scripture is given to us in the fourth chapter of Romans. Beckwith doesn't want to talk about this, and Rome doesn't want to talk about this. At the end of Romans chapter 4, Paul writes these words. Now, not for his sake only, referring to Abraham, was it written that it was reckoned to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be reckoned as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up because of our transgressions and was raised for our justification. What I'm saying here is that in Genesis 15, 6, The faith of Abraham, faith alone, at the moment, was reckoned as righteousness because Abraham believed God. He didn't do anything. He didn't leave Haran and go to a land promised. He didn't offer Isaac, his son, to be sacrificed on the altar in Genesis 15, 6. He simply believed the promise of God. And that believing the promise of God corresponds now, according to the end of Romans 4, with believing the promise of God in Christ Jesus. The parallel is clear. The exercise of Abraham's faith in leaving Haran and offering up Isaac did not have the same correspondence to believing God as Genesis 15, 6 does. So what I'm saying here is that Abraham believed the promises of God in Genesis 15, 6, and Paul mentions it now for his sake only was it written that it was reckoned to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be reckoned as those who believe God, that God raised Jesus Christ, our Lord, from the dead, and that he was delivered for our transgressions and was raised for our justification. Our justification is by faith alone because we believe the promises of God that that's exactly what he has promised to us. It's exactly the same as Abraham. Perhaps this is why in Galatians 3, 5, and 10, Paul writes again, Even so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel before to Abraham, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you. The correspondence between Genesis 15, 6 and every single Christian believer is identical. Believe the promise of God. And the promise of God is justification by faith alone in Christ alone. That's the promise. The promise to Abraham was, I will make many nations of you. You will be the father. You will be the father of many nations. And as the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky will your descendants be. And it will be through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For the promise given to Abraham and his seed was not to many seeds, but to one seed, Jesus Christ. So it all comes together. So for Roman Catholic novice theologians like Beckwith, I think is, and others to come along and say, justification is progressive. It starts in infant baptism. It grows. It increases with your good works. And 
Look at Abraham. He was justified when he left Haran. He was justified when he believed God. He was justified again when he offered up Isaac. No, wrong. No, that's not what Scripture is teaching. This is a denial of the correspondence and a misuse of Scripture. And what I'm doing now is I'm moving forward with Beckwith because he has to defend the Roman Catholic religion in some way, shape, or form. Uh, sometimes when you're reading other theologians and they're trying to cement home a point and they're, they're, they're enthusiastic about what they're saying, you might catch them in a mistake. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Beckwith made a big mistake. He says in his book that, uh, I'll quote him, he says, Yet James 2, 21 through 24 states that Abraham's faith justified him years after that incident in Genesis 15, 6, when he obeyed God and attempted to offer his son as Isaac as a sacrifice. That's not true. James chapter 2, 21 through 24 does not say that Abraham was justified when he offered up his son Isaac. On the contrary, uh, James says pretty much the opposite. And if you take out your Bible the, uh, and turn to it, you'll read this. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? It doesn't say that J James does not say that Abraham was justified by faith when he offered up Isaac. It says just the opposite. Abraham, our father, was justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. But then James hearkens back to Genesis 15, 6 in the very next sentence. And he says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. And there James quotes again. Genesis 15, 6, to prove the point. So, I bring this up as a small matter of biblical interpretation, exposition, and exegesis. And I'd encourage you, as a Christian, go to the text and make sure that the text is quoted properly and make sure that the interpretation and application of the text makes sense. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Beckwith in his zeal made a mistake with James chapter 2. But the Roman Catholic religion makes even a bigger mistake in James 2, as we'll see as we move forward in our understanding. Beckwith goes on to say, although Paul certainly refers to justification as a past event, he also presents it as a continuing process, and as well as one that has not been fully achieved. Well, does Paul really present justification as a continuing process? Is there one verse in Scripture that says justification is a continuing process, that it's progressive, that it can be maintained by works, that it can be preserved by works, that it can be increased by works? No, there's not a single verse in all of the New Testament or the Old Testament or anywhere that says these things. So how does Beckwith find proof? Well, he finds proof by quoting 1 Corinthians 1.18, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. The problem is that none of these verses mentions the word justification. Now listen carefully. For Rome, they don't have to. For instance, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, Paul writes, For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Well, Paul says, for those of us who are being saved, meaning the saved ones, the ones who are being saved. Rome said, no, that's not what it means. Beckwith says, for us who are being saved, we are, we're not saved, we are being saved. It's a process, it's a progression. We're being saved. And, of course, Rome believes that there's no difference between the word saved and the word justified. To them, it's all one piece. So when he finds a verse that says, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, he reads it, and to us who are being justified, it is the power of God. And he translates being justified as a process of being justified, just like we are a process of being saved. We don't read it that way, and we don't interpret it that way. 
We interpret it this way, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, to the ones being saved, they are saved. They're not in a process of salvation. They are saved. He quotes 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word I preached to you. He says, see, it's a process. If you hold it fast, the process continues. If you don't hold it fast, the process stops, and it has to be started up again by good works. We say, no, we don't read it that way. Paul is simply saying, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word preached to you. In other words, if your faith is genuine, if your faith is real, if you hold it fast, it gives proof that you are saved. It's a proof of salvation. It's a realization that something has occurred inside of you, and that what has occurred is salvation. He quotes 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16, For we are fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So every time he sees being saved, he translates it process. We're in the process of being saved. And saved equals justification. Therefore, we have a process of justification. We read it just the opposite. For we are fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved. I'm saved. You're saved. This man is saved. That man is saved. We are all being saved by the grace of God. We're being saved by faith alone. And we're the ones who are being saved, one person at a time. How do I know this? I know this because salvation in the New Testament is a broad, comprehensive term that includes, at times, regeneration, redemption, reconciliation, justification, sanctification, and glorification. But one thing is for sure. It is not a process. It is a point-in-time fact that occurs when one is born from above and justified by the verdict of God and given the righteousness of Christ. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 1, 8, so, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or be ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us, called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. He saved us, past tense. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, Titus chapter 3, verse 4, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Every Christian can say, I'm saved by the grace of God. I have been saved. It's nothing that I have done. I've contributed nothing to my salvation. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, by grace through faith you have been saved. You're not in a process of justification. You're not in a process of salvation. It is not ongoing. The security of the believer is secure because God has given you the righteousness of Christ and reckoned you justify on that basis. Beckwith goes on to say in Defending Rome that he believes that Romans 4, in quoting Genesis 15, 6, does not teach a once and for all forensic imputation of righteousness. He said it simply doesn't teach that. That's a quote from him. Listen to him. I quote him from page 101. The text would have to unequivocally state that Abraham was reckoned righteous at one decisive moment and yet remained inherently unrighteous, which is the Protestant doctrine of forensic justification. He says the text would have to state that, without a doubt, 
that Abraham was reckoned righteous at one decisive moment and yet remained inherently unrighteous. Well, we would say the text does say that Abraham was reckoned righteous by faith apart from works, any works, works of the law or any other kinds of works. And we would have to read somewhere where it is ongoing, progressive, and it happened to Abraham again and again and again and again. In the absence of that, we'll take the one moment that Paul mentions and James mentions as a seminal moment. We don't have to we don't have to prove that that verse says it's the only time when the scriptures don't have any other time. But let's move on. A more telling response would be this. Justification is not based upon inherent righteousness. If it was, it would not be based upon faith alone. It would be based upon inherent righteousness, and the scriptures do not teach that. It is not based upon grace-aided translation into good works either, for we are clearly not justified by works. We also respond that forensic justification does not make one righteous. I would say that if there is a sticking point, and Beckwith probably would agree, and I know Roman Catholic theology agrees, is that Roman Catholics are hung up on this idea that God can declare somebody justified, acquitted from their sins, and leave them inherently unjust and unrighteous in the process. Well, we say, what's the matter with that? They say, it's, it's a lie. It, you're telling me that that person is acquitted while he's still unjust? We're telling that he's acquitted while he's still unrighteous? And we say, yes, that's precisely what we're telling you. Because the acquittal and the verdict of justification is not based upon anything within that person, can never be, because that person can never be inherently righteous enough to qualify for it. Hence, it's the righteousness of Christ and Christ alone, not his translation into good works. Rome hates that talk. They don't believe it. It's foreign to them. They argue against it time and time again, and Beckwith is right with them. But there's another thing at work here. And the other thing at work here is the idea that I am a justified person, I'm an acquitted person on the basis of Jesus Christ's righteousness alone. However, I'm left alone with this. That's it. That's it. I'm acquitted. I'm justified. That's it. Nothing else happens to me. Rome argues that's crazy. Something else must happen. And we would say precisely, something else does happen. You receive the mind of Christ. You receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the process of sanctification begins in you. Not the process of justification, but the process of sanctification. So Rome, in their hatred of the righteousness of Christ as the ground of justification, says it's folly to think that God would justify somebody and leave them inherently unrighteous, and we would agree. It is folly. But justification doesn't make them inherently righteous. That is reserved for the work of the Holy Spirit. It's reserved for sanctification process. It's reserved for being given the mind of Christ. And that is the process known as sanctification. And it's guaranteed. So on the one hand, we're arguing, yes, we are changed, but justification doesn't change us. Sanctification changes us. No, justification are not, and sanctification are not the same. One is complete, final, and it is forever. It's eternal. It's justification based upon what Christ and the other is sanctification. How do I know this? I know this because the Bible teaches sanctification, post-justification. Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. Every single person predestined to justification is predestined to conformity to Jesus Christ. He doesn't leave us all alone in an unethical unrighteous, 
moronic state of disobedience and filth. He cleans us up, and that cleansing is the doctrine of sanctification and being conformed to the image of his Son. It doesn't stop. Beckwith goes on. And one verse that Beckwith calls upon, he says, this did it for me. He said, I'm reading the scriptures and this verse did it to me is Romans 5, 19. Romans 5, 19 comes at the end of Romans 5, 15 through 19. But Beckwith holds on to Romans 5.19, and 5.19 says this, For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, and the one man there is Adam, of course, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Now for Beckwith, he reads that sentence Even so, through the obedience of one, Jesus Christ, he's the one, the opposite of Adam, the many will be made righteous. So he says, see, we're made righteous. That's the deal. That's justification, being made righteous. And when we're made righteous through ethical renewal, through grace that comes through the sacraments, then we qualify for justification. So we say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I I, I know, we realize that Paul says the many will be made righteous. But let's take a look at the context. Does Paul really say that we're made righteous and that qualifies us for justification? The answer is no. No, not at all. There are re- I'm going to get into the text here just a little bit, but there are reasons why we say no. And the reason is if you begin in Romans chapter 5 and read 15 through 19, you're going to get a totally different view of this. Paul begins... 5, verse 15, by saying, but the free gift is not like the transgression, contrasting Adam and Jesus Christ. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. The gift. What's the gift? Verse 16, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation, but on the other hand, the free gift. So Paul says it is a gift in verse 15. It is a gift in verse 16. It's a free gift at the end of verse 16. And in verse 17, he says, For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. That's verse 17. So in verse 15, it's the gift. Verse 16, the gift. Verse 16, the free gift. Verse 17, the gift of righteousness. We come to verse 18. So then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Clearly, the justification of life to all men is the gift of righteousness. It is the free gift. It is the gift. It is the gift. It's the gift again and again and again. So we come to verse 19 where Paul says, For as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. How will they be made righteous? How? They will be made righteous by receiving the gift, the gift, the gift, the free gift, the gift of righteousness, the gift of justification. It is not being made ethically or internally righteous that Paul has in mind here. What he has in mind here is to be gifted the righteousness of justification, which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. A better translation of this, I think, is in the NIV, where the word made, a Greek term here, should better be translated, I think, constituted, and that's how NIV translate. If you want to get into the Greek translation of this, it won't solve everything, but it's better to hear Paul say this, even through the obedience of one, many will be uh, constituted sinners, and they are, and they're made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be constituted righteous, and they are. They are justified, and that is the gift. As we move forward with Beckwith, I want to make certain that we understand 
He is convinced that the Pauline corpus makes no distinction between justification and sanctification. We are convinced that there is a massive difference between the two concepts, concepts justification and sanctification. He is convinced that God justifies us by making us righteous. We are convinced that God justifies us because we can't be made righteous enough. So we're given the righteousness of Christ. However, his biggest, perhaps, and most profound appeal to the scripture will always come, and Roman Catholics will always come, from James chapter 2. Beckwith is no exception. He believes that it's settled for all. I quote him from his book, when he says, in James 2, we are told justification is not by faith alone, once and for all. So does James chapter 2 teach that we are justified by good works, obedience to Roman Catholic sacraments, by our own faithful good works given to us by grace through some sort of religious system? I don't think so. I think a careful understanding of James 2 is in order. And every single Christian needs to be responsible and responsive to James chapter 2. This is the seminal passage of Scripture that Roman Catholic scholars, Roman Catholic apologists, Roman Catholic writers appeal to when they object to justification by faith alone. They say it doesn't even teach that. The words aren't even there. The words there are just the opposite. And we say, but that's the gist of what James is saying. And they say, that is not the gist of what he is saying. So in our final segment here, we just want to take a second to read this section of scripture and then make some comments on it. James writes these words. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. And I, by my works, will show you my faith. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you shallow man, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by works. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 6 again. And he was called a friend of God. Now here's the Roman Catholic verse. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Well, in the first place, Rome doesn't believe that we're justified by works. That is not their theology. They believe we're justified by faith plus works. So, Genesis 2.24 says too much for them. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Rome doesn't believe a man is justified by works. So they can't make too much hay out of it. But what they can say is that it's faith plus works. It is not faith alone. Because the text says, you, said a man, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So what do we say to this? Is Rome right? Have they finally caught up with our well-meaning but confused and distorted view of Scripture? I don't think so. We would argue that there is such a thing as dead faith. That's the beginning of the argument against Rome. Indeed, faith, if it has not works, is dead. It's dead because it's by itself. This is critically important to understand Paul's, uh, James' argument as well as Paul's argument. There is a rubbish faith fit for the trash heap. The only way to tell if someone has genuine faith 
is to see if it produces works or fruit. This is the teaching of James. The demonstration of faith to prove that it is not dead is works or fruit. Show me your faith without works. It's impossible to do so. I will show you my faith by my works. Abraham showed the world forever his faith by his works. He showed his faith by his works. He was not justified by his works, nor was he justified by his faith plus works. He showed his faith by his works. In fact, the works completed the verdict of his faith. The demonstration of faith by works and fruit, is the burden of James. The Greek word used here for show is the Greek word dipneo. You don't need to remember that. It just means to show, present, or exhibit. James uses this exact same word in James 3.13 when he asks the question, Who is wise? Let him show it. Let him demonstrate it. I'm going to argue that the burden of James is demonstration of faith by works to show or exhibit that the faith is alive and not dead. This theme will carry through to the end of the entire passage. Demons have a dead faith even though they are believing that God is one. They believe in shudder. This is dead faith because it has no works. In vain, it is in vain, the man that does know that faith without works is barren. It's hollow. It's inoperative. The theme of the entire passage of James 2 begins in verse 17 and ends in verse 26. James illustrates the point by insisting that faith only, I'm using my words carefully here, that faith only cannot possibly justify. Faith only. Faith alone justifies, but faith only cannot justify. The reformers to a man insisted that a man is justified by faith that is not only. Therefore, they said we are justified by faith alone, but we are not justified by a faith that is alone. Let me repeat that. James illustrates by insisting that faith only cannot justify. Faith alone justifies The reformers reiterate this. We are not justified by faith only, but by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. Faith is, for it to be alive, must evident works. Works demonstrates faith as true and completes faith. This working together, this synergy of faith and works, is proof of a living faith which justifies. Abraham was declared justified and proved his faith to be alive by his obedience and fulfilled the scripture which taught us that Abraham was justified by faith to begin with. The burden of James is not a works justification or a merit-based salvation. It is the authenticity of faith that is James' goal. Alone faith that remains alone cannot justify the ungodly. It is impossible. We would agree with that. But yet, we are justified by faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. Every justified person produces fruit. Every justified person produces works because God guarantees it. We are justified unto works. We are saved unto works. Ephesians 2.10 is critical in this. We are justified by faith alone, saved by faith alone, not by works for good works that he predestined before in the foundation of the world. So it's irresponsible for Rome to come to this passage and say that we are justified by works. They can't say that because they don't believe that, even though that's what the text says. We're justified by works, not by faith alone. So we chase them off of that because they don't believe it. But they do believe we're justified by faith plus works. And we say, no, we're justified by faith alone. But it's the faith that produces works. Finally, and I know we've run through this very quickly and we'll have a short review. Does 
a person who converts from evangelicalism in high and lofty places like Francis Beckwith, president of the Evangelical Theological Society, leaving his post, resigning, returning to... Does he have a clear view of the Roman Catholic religion and is he willing to set it forth? Put all the cards on the table. My answer is no. I think that he must wordsmith. I think that he must make up a hybrid religion because he can't bear the truth about the Roman Catholic teaching. He can't bear it. And at the end of his book, he says this, for the practicing Catholic, good works, including participating in the sacraments, works of charity and prayer, are not for the purpose of earning heaven. Really? Canon 32. If anyone saith that good works of the one that is justified are in such a manner the gifts of God that they are not also good merits of him that is justified, or that the said justified by good works which he performs through the grace of God and the merit of Christ does not truly merit increase of grace, eternal life, and the attainment of eternal life, let him be accursed. Canon 32 says, Good works merit increase of grace, eternal life, and the attainment of eternal life. Beckwith says, For the practicing Catholic, good works are not for the purpose of earning heaven. He can't bear it. He can't be genuine with his own religion. He says, As I have said, the purpose of good works for the Catholic is not to get you into heaven but to get heaven into you. Kind of cute, huh? To get heaven into you. You mean to be justified by good works? That's what the canon says. You mean to have right standing with God by your good works? Is that what you mean by getting heaven into you? But to say it's not to get you into heaven flies in the face of canon 32. It certainly does get you into heaven. You're accursed if you don't believe it. Good works are for increase and attainment of eternal life. So, how do we wrap this up? I think we wrap it up by understanding that it's a hollow statement for Roman Catholic theologians to say that God leaves us alone, unrighteous, although he declares us to be righteous. They call it the big lie. I'm saying he doesn't leave us alone. He sanctifies us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. But that's not from justification. It stems from it, but that's not what justification does. Also, Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We would agree. God changes us. Justification doesn't change us. We are changed from, stemming from justification. Finally, uh, the Apostle Paul in this vein says, We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. Indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a big deal. Sanctification is a big deal. The mind of Christ is a big deal. But those things are not justification. And because Rome gets it wrong on justification, they get it wrong on everything else. Justification is a judicial declaration that the righteousness of Christ stands in the place of sinners who cannot possibly justify themselves by good works. Not good works done in faith. Not good works done in grace. Not good works done by a changed heart through some sacramental system invented by Rome. But along with justification comes the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the mind of Christ. It is an empty claim to say that justification leaves the sinner all alone just as he was. Technically, justification does exactly that. But remember, stemming from it is sanctification which changes everything. Now in closing, I want to say this. Francis Beckwith is 100% totally sold out to collaborative salvation. Collaborative salvation means we do our share, God does his share. We go through the baptism, we go through the sacraments, 
We go through the stations of the cross. We go through penance. We go through all of these grace-getting, grace-begetting things. We go through the Eucharist. We go through the Mass. We understand by ingesting the, the bread, sins are forgiven. We do all that we can do. But God does his share as well. It's collaborative. And listen to how he puts it. Quote from Francis J. Beckwith, preeminent scholar, doctor, philosopher, head of Baylor University Religious Department. I quote him, I do nothing without the initiation of the Holy Spirit. It is not my merit, it is his. And yet there's a mystery here. I cooperate with this grace, but I contribute nothing to it. In my obedience, I'm allowing the grace of God to transform me, and yet it is wholly God's doing. I am confident of my eternal fate, but confidence in that eternal fate is not the exclusive purpose of justification. We would say just the opposite. The exclusive purpose of justification is to make you confident of your eternal state, which is heaven. We say, to cooperate with grace is to attend the Roman Catholic sacramental system and to do good things. All of the merit is God's, except in Rome, nothing happens unless man allows the grace of God to transform him. Man contributes nothing except his obedience. Man contributes nothing except his cooperation. Man contributes nothing except he must obey. Man contributes nothing, and yet he allows God. This is wordsmithing at its worst. It is twisting. It is contradictory. And it is Roman Catholic at its best. And it is not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Having said that, here's what I want you to take away from our discussion in this video. Rome teaches that the Bible only dismisses works of Mosaic law for justification, not their good works. That's number one. Number two, Rome teaches that justification is progressive, increased and maintained by good works. Thirdly, Rome misuses the book of James and doesn't understand the purpose of James in chapter two. Number four, Rome teaches that works save, and that the words saved and justified are the same, and that the words justification and sanctification are the same. Hence, it's all jumbled up together, mixed in with their sacraments and their good works. Rome does not believe that justification does not make a person inherently holy. Rome believes that justification is a staged thing, beginning with baptism, infant baptism, or adult baptism, and it's progressive. We don't. It's one point in time, and the ground is certainly not baptism. It's God's judicial act decreed from the foundation of the world, and the only condition is faith, and God meets that condition by giving that faith. Rome believes God makes us righteous in order for us to qualify to be justified. We believe the opposite. We believe that God justifies the ungodly and qualifies us for heaven because he does so on the basis of Christ's righteousness. I also want you to take home with you that those who are converted to Rome ultimately misrepresent Rome. They never go to the canons of the Council of Trent. They never want to talk about justification. They want to worm their way out of it. They want to wordsmith their way out of it. They want to ignore it. There is nothing in Francis Beckwith's summary of why he converted to Rome on page 60 of his book. There is nothing mentioned of the Council of Trent. And yet, he says, I have become convinced that the Catholic creeds and the Catholic ecumenical councils, the first six, as well as the canons of Orange and the authority, 
the authoritative renderings of Christian doctrines and ecclesiastical pronouncements started me on the road to Catholicism and they are all from biblical exegesis and nothing more. He never mentions Trent. Doesn't want to touch it. We do. And finally, there's double speak in Rome. It's all of God. It's all of God. God is graceful. God allows me to suffer for my own sin. God allows me to go to purgatory. God is a wonderful God. His grace allows me to work for my salvation. He invented salvation. He put it together in a package, sacramentalized it, and gave it to us. What a gracious, wonderful God. They think that is God's grace. Have I made myself clear? It couldn't be more opposite than the faith of a Christian who believes that we are justified by faith alone, in the finished work of Christ alone, and on that solid rock we stand. Furthermore, we believe that the Bible is the only word of God, and the trust in councils, trust in early church fathers, trust in wordsmithing, trust in taking passages out of contest, trust in manipulating words and distortions, are never going to fly with Christians. And I pray that all of you watching this at home or watching it wherever you are will take seriously the world that we live in. It's a scary world and made even scarier by the likes of Dr. Francis J. Beckwith. Thank you for watching today. What you're looking at is proclaiming the gospel. News from evangelist Mike Jenner. And what Mike has here, he has an outstanding ministry to Roman Catholics. He's a former Roman Catholic himself. I couldn't resist just throwing this in at the end of Rob's presentation on Frank Beckwith concerning Roman Catholicism. In Jenner's internet uh, digital newsletter here, as you can see here from June 2021, it says Rome's rejection of the Christian faith. It is outrageous that so many of our evangelical leaders continue to promote unity with the apostate Roman Catholic Church rather than identify it as a huge mission field of 1.3 billion precious souls. They embrace it as a Christian denomination made up of brothers and sisters in Christ. Tragically, their fallacious position discourages their followers from evangelizing Catholics. We must set the record straight. Catholics need to be evangelized because their religion has rejected the Christian faith. This is what I was saying at the beginning of this presentation. Most evangelicals are not real Christians at all. So they can easily get along with heretics, false prophets, Pelagians, antinomians, whatever it might be, any, any stripe of heretic. This evangelical community, as it calls itself, is, is made up mainly over 80%, 87%. Are not real anyway. So it only makes sense that they're going to go along with false religions like Roman Catholicism. Now, continuing with Mike Jenner's article here, it says, Rome rejects the supremacy of God's word. God has exalted his name and his word above all things. Psalm 138.2, all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16, those who reject or dismiss God's word as their supreme authority fall into serious error and peril. Rome has done this by elevating its ungodly traditions, which have evolved over 1,600 years, to be equal in authority with Scripture. Rome teaches that sacred tradition and sacred Scripture make up a single sacred deposit of the word of God, end quote. Rome rejects the sufficiency of God's word. Jesus is sufficient to save sinners completely by the offering of himself once for all sin, for all time. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 25 through 27. Hebrews 10, verse 10, verse 14, and verse 18. His blood is sufficient to purify every believer from every sin. His death is sufficient to cancel the eternal sin debt of every believer. Colossians 2.14, 1 John 1.7. Rome rejects the sufficiency of Christ 
by continuing the work of redemption through the sacrifice of the mass and by promoting the fable of purgatory and the sacerdotal priesthood. Rome rejects the singularity of God's gospel. God's one and only gospel offers salvation by grace apart from merit through faith in Christ alone, apart from works, according to scripture alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Titus 3, 5. Rome rejects this gospel and offers a distorted gospel which brings condemnation on those who teach it. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Rome's gospel requires Catholics to receive sacraments, observe the commandments, partake in the Eucharist, do good works, and obtain indulgences. And by the way, you ought to see that video that Rob Zins made on how Roman Catholic teaching itself condemns 98% of Roman Catholics to hell because they don't confess their sins to a priest. That's one of their requirements for salvation. Anyway, check that video out when you get a chance. Anyway, any perversion of the gospel is ultimately the devil's delusion, which keeps his captives in religious bondage, 2 Timothy 2, 24-26. Rome rejects the sovereignty of God's grace. Clearly, it is the will of God, not man's will, that determines who will be born again and graciously adopted into the Father's eternal family. John 1, 12-13. Yet, Rome rejects God's sovereignty by teaching it is the will of man through water baptism that determines who will be born of God. Rome says baptism makes the neophyte a new creature, an adopted son of God, and co-heir with him, end quote. Rome rejects the security of God's children. The promise of God's gospel is eternal life, which is upheld by the power of God. 1 Peter 1, 3-5. The Lord Jesus promises to keep those he has saved. John chapter 6, 37-39. The divine gift of eternal life can never be lost or revoked. John 10, 28, Romans 11, 29. Rome rejects this assurance by saying those justified by water baptism who die in mortal sin will go to hell. Hopefully this article will encourage Christians to recognize the urgent need to evangelize Catholics with the supreme authority of God's word and his glorious gospel. So keep that in mind and why all this is so important and the stakes involved. What we're dealing with basically is a lot of evangelicals who are not real born again, blood-bought Christians who hold too fast to the word of God. So they, anything coming down the pike, they can, they can buy. And that means there's only a few of us real Christians out there that will have to do this evangelism work uh, by the, through the power of the Holy Spirit to enlighten lost sinners to the truth of God's Word. Uh, with that, I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank Rob Zins for his fine presentation and for being with us here today. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. And just remember this, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And that Jesus has to be the true Jesus of the Bible, not some piece of bread at a Roman Catholic mass in their phony religious services. So you need the true Jesus of the Bible, not some phony Jesus of all these false religions out there, but the Christ of Scripture. Well, with that said, may the Lord... Bless you all. Thank you for being with us. Bye-bye. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking 
screens. <laughs>